Welcome back to season three of ASD Market Week's podcast, Let's Talk a Little Shop, with your host, me, Emily Lewis. We're going to tackle the hard subjects. So buckle up and get ready for season three. We're going to have a lot of fun. Welcome back to another episode of ASD Market Week's podcast, Let's Talk a Little Shop. Today, I am very lucky to have someone who is absolutely going to school me on all things AI. So I've got my smart glasses on. I'm ready. I'm ready to learn. But Mr. Jeremy Bergstein is here, and he is the founder of an agency called The Science Project. And if you haven't heard of The Science Project, let me just list off a few of Jeremy's clients for you. A little known brand called Nike, another brand called Kiehl's. Let me see. I'm looking at your website because it was such a long list. Uniqlo, Chanel, Calvin Klein, The Simon Group, Bloomingdale's, Kate Spade. I could keep going on and on and on, Jeremy, because the list of clients that you have worked with is so impressive. But I want to turn it over to you. And tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are and what the science project is. Sure. Well, first of all, Emily, thank you for having me. Truly great to be here. Um, Let's see, science project. Um, I used to be a New York City public school teacher, a science teacher. So that's where the science project came from. I love Um, that, by the way. I love that. (laughs) Still very much the science teacher, if you got to know me. Um, Science, the Science Project um, has, you know, is an agency and it, it's a creative and strategy agency that really set out to create um, conversion based experiences across the expanded consumer landscape. And what that's meant over um, the last decade plus is an expanding kind of um, ecosystem. You know, we began right. as digital first, really understanding how to engage consumers, engage shoppers, engage people in digital spaces. And then we were asked to create uh, interaction and conversion in physical spaces and bridge digital and physical. And that's where we really started to make a name for ourselves. And then as we've started to expand into virtual or mixed reality spaces, how can we take that same discipline around, you know, what is a brand, a product, a, a, you know, an event, what makes it special and how can we get people to interact with it and transact with it in physical, digital, virtual, mixed reality, and a whole variety, you know, a whole variety of these future yeah. ecosystems. So all, all the worlds we have to live in nowadays. Yeah. That's right. And, you know, the um, the work that we've done, w- you know, with brands, both, you know, some of the best in the world and some of the most exciting and new in the world is all very much um, held to that same standard as really figuring out what makes uh, a, a brand really special. What are its distinct characteristics that draw customers, yeah. shoppers, people to, you know, to that experience and how can we get them to fall in love with it across all these different types of spaces. And, you know, we use technology and we use great design and mm-hmm. use great creative to do that. You said something that stuck out in my mind and I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to steal this because I'm going <laughs> to utilize it. You said conversion based creative agency. Yeah. I've never heard that. And is there a reason that you combine those words? Because I think conversion based rings true to one side of your brain, creative rings true to another side, and you're yeah. mixing two. And I love that. You know, uh, it's it, it's a deeper conversation almost, but I've had so many people over the years be like, God, that's amazing. You should use that more often. And I've oftentimes shied away from it because sometimes people just think that you're thinking of a cash register when you say, you know, conversion based creative and the creatives really want to hear about this Mm -hmm. elevated, beautiful, distinct experience. Whereas the business people want to hear about conversion oriented, like funnels and metrics and stuff and how they come together and how that balance is created 
you know, can be a challenge. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I use that sometimes and I should use it more actually as of like kind of matured in my career, I've embraced what makes certainly, you know, me and my thinking special. Whereas maybe before I was like just creative or just business now, you know, the, the science project very squarely is in that space of, you know, conversion oriented, creative experience. Yeah. I feel like that's the title of a book for you. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and say that because as a marketer, good marketers are exactly that. They're yeah, not right. just creative. They're not just conversion based cash register. To your point, you have to really combine both. And it is a special unicorn, in my opinion, that can do that. So I, I'm calling it now. That's the title of, of your <laughs> Your, whether it's your autobiography or your business book, I, I love it. And I, I it really rang true to me. So we're going to get into the science project and we're going to get into tapping into your knowledge base of all things digital. But before we do that, I want to get to know Jeremy a little bit better. So if you'll allow me, I, I'm going to ask maybe some more personal questions. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up, how you grew up. Um, and anything you want to share with us about your childhood? Sure. Um, grew up um, in the suburbs of New York City. Um, went to college in Oregon, um, in the outskirts of Portland. Was very much like an outdoor junkie. Went out there to climb rocks, climb mountains, boat rivers, um, surf as much as I could. So I wanted to just see the whole West Coast of our amazing country, um, lived there, went to uh, went to school there, lived in Colorado, Vermont, <laughs> California. I all love the, it. I love it. All the suspects. Um, yeah. And I mean, like, you know, I was an outdoor guide for um, for many years, a uh, river guide and then a uh, uh, guide for Outward Bound taking you know, taking ah, youth out, um, yeah. yeah, you know, rock climbing, boating, canoeing, backpacking. Um, and then that brought me back to, uh, New York city to be, um, a environmental science teacher and biology teacher and, you know, science teacher. So for sure. Did you want to be a teacher at a young age or was that something that came about later? Yeah. I mean, as far as being a teacher goes, I, I just found that I was always like, you know, that was one of my highest functions was spending time with people explaining, um, you know, explaining kind of complicated concepts, making them simple, making them fun, making them entertaining, and then guiding them along on a process together. And I think that that's, yeah. you know, that's come from, came from guiding, came from teaching, and that's very much informed how um, I, you know, the sort of North star of my business. Take us through that journey from being a science teacher to deciding to start a marketing agency. What did that look like? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I was living in New York city and unfortunately teaching high school in New York city is not the easiest thing to do. So I decided to give something else a try. Nice. So regret it, but I, you know, it's, it's part of, you know, big part of growth, like, you know, what I, my career tra trajectory. I am sure there were so many feelings of trepidation, fear, failure, all of the human, you know, emotions that, that come up. If there's somebody else that's listening that is thinking about a career shift from, you know, one industry that doesn't necessarily seem connected to another industry, what are your, you know, quick piece of advice for them? Uh, you know, it, there's, yeah, just, just do it. <laughs> like there's thinking <laughs> and then there's doing, like you got to get, you know, you always got to stay moving and any, any um, mistakes that I've ever made have always been in the half steps and the hesitations. So you be That's decisive great. and do it. That's great. Well, I can't I can't credit you for the just do it tagline, but yeah. that leads me perfectly into my next question, because you work with amazing clients, Nike being one. Mm -hmm. 
Are there some stories that stick out in your mind that you can share? Obviously, I know there's client uh, confidentiality, but what are some stories that you can share with us about some mistakes in the digital landscape that you've seen clients make? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Too many to share? Yes, certainly a lot. I think that some of the biggest mistakes, some of the biggest errors and the biggest challenges have been in, um, you know, infrastructure and in foundation. I think that marketing and speaking with customers is is sort of built for iteration, is built for, you know, um, trying something out, finding out if it works, if it doesn't work, readjusting and iterating and improving. And that type of communication has existed, you know, predated digital, digital, you would see what worked, see wouldn't, wouldn't work with, with digital, um, collecting data, understanding your customers, building that like strong enterprise, that strong business and brand enterprise where you're creating a, a, a stack of technology that can, um, you know, that can accommodate data. It can, you know, inform you as to what is performing and not performing. So I think the biggest mistakes and errors are sort of made in not building the um, foundation correctly. There's so many metaphors for sure, Mm -hmm. Emily, like somebody Mm -hmm. once described their systems to me like that, you know, elephant that's on top of a stool that's balancing on top of a house that's like juggling, you know, like, and that's how the foundation for their technology was built. And, you know, it's hard to build a business that way. And that's one of the things I can say, you know, there's good and bad things about an agency, but, um, you know, being able to go into different customers and different clients and different businesses and assess what their strengths, what their weaknesses are, and be able to build correctly to, you know, capitalize on where they're strong and make recommendations on how to, um, you know, help them like get away from their weak places, repair them, or just stay away from them. It's certainly one of the things that I think is, you know, most, most critical with being, um, you know, being an agency. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, true problem solver. I mean, that, in in my opinion, is what an agency's job is, is you are totally. coming in and figuring out what puzzle pieces are missing and you're creating solves for, for those problems that the agency, you know, has an expertise in. Totally. I want to, I want to switch lanes just a little bit because the past year has most certainly taken a, a turn towards AI and AI is always, you know, it's been around for a very long time. However, with the release of chat GPT, and I think that, you know, it's become commonplace knowledge amongst, you know, everyone from a teacher to a marketer to a real estate agent, what AI is. I think it was this term that the technology industry knew for a very long time, you know, was used in Silicon Valley, but now it is an Every news article, it is mainstream, you know, bloggers are using it to help them, you know, write their blog posts, marketers, I know, you know, we we use it to help us on different levels. However, there's been a lot of controversy around AI, you know, just recently in the past few months, we've had big music groups that are suing certain AI companies. We now have an actor strike where part of that conversation and the writer strike, it's all about AI. So if you don't mind, start with what is AI and what do you feel are some of the advantages of AI and some of the challenges to AI as we see it today? I, you know, a- AI, artificial intelligence, um, you know, I, I refer to it as machine learning because it's really like a, a machine going and processing information and making uh, quote unquote decisions or determinations, you know, through its machine learning. 
So mm -hmm. AI slash ML slash machine learning. So it's going and sorting through gargantuan amounts of data really very quickly and making determinations, making decisions based upon, based upon that data. Um, so that data can either be, you know, you've heard it referred to as large language models. So it can be, um, written data, it could be code data, it could be um, visual data, it could be, you know, like I was just on a call earlier um, and it, it was talking about computer vision, right? Computer vision is cameras, like a camera and a phone or a security camera seeing pictures, millions of pictures, and now that machine learning is sorting through those pictures and it's learning from the pictures and it's learning when somebody picks something up and puts it in their purse that, you know, to flag them potentially because they could be stealing something. So it's a machine making determinations, massive amounts of data, but it's, and it's, I guess it's learning, you know, I don't, mm -hmm. know, it, it's still not like, it's not intelligence, it's learning, you know, it's machine learning. So um, I think that you always have to sort of keep your head on straight with something like this. And Right now, um, I think it just came into a little bit more focus with chat GPT and with the fact that consumers could now see the power of it. And it's accelerating, you know, incredibly fast. And there's also no, um, we, we saw the sort of idea that it is without end, which is, I think, scary for all of us. Like the idea that it's incrementally, in, you know, it's accelerating really very quickly. But mm -hmm. also there was nobody saying like, well, this is the limit of it. Basically, all the messaging that we're hearing is like this, this is without limit. So, you know, that's I think that that's certainly scary for everybody. Mm -hmm. But having, you know, played with it. Um, in a couple different scenarios, like, you know, there's some good, there's some bad, and there's some really ugly. How are you utilizing AI? I mean, there's a couple different tools, you know, there's, there's, there's some tools that we're using. I know that the team is using, um, you know, some basic AI tools that are embedded in like the creative suites from Adobe and then also from mm -hmm. Canva that mm -hmm. are just simple, you know, simple tools around image editing, around recommendations, around like copy checking, but they're, they're basic, they're smart and they're fun and they're cool, but they're basic. So there are sort of improved tool sets there. There's also like some ways, you know, some automation that we're recommending for some businesses around their marketing stack that's helping to you know, make software more software-y. And I say that it's like making software faster, more better consolidated process and, you know, more sort of acute um, results out of searches and queries and, you know, getting information. And then um, also, you know, I'm doing a couple uh, projects right now with some companies that are utilizing AI fairly heavily and helping them find um, use cases in retail, helping them be like, okay, you know, and I think that that's a big thing that we found over the last few years is uh, technology is accelerated and far mm -hmm. out the use, the ability to use it. There's like enough technology for, you know, there, there's so much technology, but actually putting it to use with people with brands in real situations has, uh, I think, dramatically lagged behind. Can you give us an example of how someone, client or not, how someone is using it in retail? Um, sure. I mean, I'm working with one client who is just trying to create a better checkout experience in, you know, in their stores and they want to just create a more frictionless checkout. They're always trying to reduce Mm -hmm. throughput on checkout so people have an easier time can check out faster and in this case they're taking computer vision and um using it to identify products to make sure that some of the qualifiers for you know what it is and what the price is to, is you know um so they're they're doing it to sort of smooth out the checkout process so that's an interesting one. There's, um, you know, there's also some interesting use cases 
around um, improving kind of the like product attributes, making products more findable. So if you put something online and you describe it in a certain way, but that's not how people are searching it out and looking for it, it can go out and actively assign more attributes to it to make it more searchable and findable. Um, you know, I thought that was an interesting one. There's another client that I'm working with that is, um, looking to use AI around understanding the client and creating more accurate and more interesting marketing content so that they can go and improve their marketing content, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. makes recommendations. There's obviously chatbots and those types mm -hmm. of, you know, mm -hmm things as well. But, you know, on the operational side, there's demand forecasts getting in front of and making predictions around like the ebbs and flows of product demand. So you can make sure that your inventory is um, prepared for it. There's um, pricing optimization that helps you go out and understand like where you should price your products. So yep. I think there's a, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of interesting use cases that are starting to bubble to the top and yeah do you buy into the hype that ai is taking jobs that marketers writers you know the list goes on and on are not going to have a job 10 years from now because of ai i think you need to understand it and need to know what it what it is and what it's capable of i think you need to also know the process and the steps to prepare your company for it and your job for it. And if you're Great caught, advice. yeah, if you don't understand how you can prepare your, your, your job for it and utilize these tools, then yeah, you'll be, you will probably struggle. Um, but I mean, I think it's very much like, <laughs> it's very much the same as just like technology. I mean, I certainly knew, you know, plenty of people who are, you know, stuck in the mud and like, you know, who, just didn't want to use technology. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's that's a little bit of the uh mindset that I have around it is, you know, there is a, an entire generation that grew up without computers and they had to adapt to computers. They had to adapt to the internet, oh, then right. to doing business via email. And now we've all adapted post COVID to doing business via Zoom. This is a new layer to that same conversation that's been happening totally. for, for decades now. So totally, I think you're spot on right there. It's like, you know, it's going to make it faster, more efficient, more targeted, yeah, more secure. Like, but those are the same attributes you could have said with, you know, technology 20 years ago. You could have said with, you know, closed circuit television replacing like ra radios or you know, so like yeah. So, yeah, no one's going to go to the theater anymore because now there's television, you know, yeah. um, and that that didn't that didn't happen. Um, so so I want to switch a little bit into the science project and you guys have a statement on your website that you guys are really trying and I think uh, trying is the word I use. Maybe I should rephrase that because I think you guys are working with some amazing talent. So you're achieving this mixture and combination of the digital and the physical for brands. You're bringing those two worlds together. Talk to me about how that came about and, and talk to me about how the two can live together and complement each other. And sure. or compete if you feel like they compete. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a, um, there's a lot to, there's a lot to talk about there because we've been, you know, doing that for a long time. A long time. I mean, just riding off the tail end of what we were talking about with regard to AI and the fact that it's like it's um, sort of the same, the same but different. Like, and you know, you're very much looking to create uh, continuous sort of behaviors and like attract and engage customers around those brand brand attributes like those emotions but how they get delivered in a physical space in a digital digital space in a social space in a virtual space is just slightly different so mm -hmm. um 
much like what we were talking about with AI, I try to keep um, I try to keep the sort of emotional and behavioral level um, sort of constant and simple and easy. And I'm like, okay, we're looking to engage and create awareness. How you know how does the brand really stand out, or how does the product stand out, or how does your property or your you know technology stand out? Well, here's the it's distinct and it's most powerful attributes. Here's how it fits in with a customer's life. How are we going to communicate that in a whole variety of different um, parts of the ecosystem? And then mm -hmm. how can we track it? How can we make sure it drives ultimately to conversion, which is, you know, data collection, mm -hmm. product engagement, ultimately sale, or, you know, greater average order volume for a, a visit or revisit or, you know, creating higher lifetime value. So, you know, mm -hmm. while we've always been very innovative in how we've created those experiences across these different, um, uh, like pieces of the ecosystem, we try to keep it really simple in that we're trying to use those mm -hmm. key brand attributes. It's, you know, a relationship with a customer and then how are we going to engage them? Um, and you know that like we've used some crazy different ways to engage them, but that's just, you know, good, fun marketing and creative thinking. Like, you know, tell us the craziest. I want to hear it. The craziest um, way that you, well, I mean, the crazy, the crazy, probably, I mean, we've done a lot of crazy projects. Um, <laughs> the craziest project was probably the Nestle pillow fight back in the day. We staged a giant Nestle pillow fight in Union Square on National Pillow Fight Day to try to engage younger um, younger audiences and expose them, create more awareness around Nestle, you know. But we took uh, we rigged a whole bunch of pillows um, with triggers and sensors and accelerometers, the same thing that you get in a um, in a phone. And this was early on in sort of like creative technology kind of, uh, you know, the creative technology world. So it was pretty, pretty innovative at the time. And it was really when I was like, just deep in that stuff. And I loved it. Um, so the okay. team bought a whole bunch of accelerometers and taped them onto the pillows. We dressed, I think, five teams up in different like Lycra, you know, costumes and headbands. And then they went out for a pillow fight and each time the pillows got swung and they like hit another person, there was a scoreboard on Facebook and you could track it. Okay. So that okay. was, I was wondering for those of us that didn't know what the accelerometer was, what was the purpose of that? It's the scoreboard. Okay. Yeah. I like it. But, um, you know, my favorite craziest, um, uh, you know, project was with Lady Gaga and Barney's, oh. um, and doing, okay. yeah, the, the holiday windows, which was our first holiday windows that we had done. And we ended up doing quite a few. We did Barney's, we did, um, Bloomingdale's, we did Saks Fifth Avenue, a couple other, did a lot of stuff with Simon over the years, but, you know, with Lady Gaga, it was at the beginning of Twitter and, we wanted you to tell your wildest wishes to Gaga and to Barney's and to really, um, tell your story into the store and, you know, you tweeted into the store and then it showed up in Lady Gaga's universe on these big, beautiful screens. Oh. And then Lady Gaga entered into the screens and turned into a unicorn and exploded into a million pieces. So that was, I would, you know, that wow. one was, um, probably my favorite of, of them. And, you know, it's, it was extremely innovative back then. Now it's, you know, people do stuff like that all the time, but. In terms of digital versus physical, what do you feel is a big mistake that, that people make when they're thinking about expanding into one or the other side? So maybe they're a strong retail brand that now is adopting digital or they're a strong digital brand that is now starting to think about retail. What do you see are some of those common mistakes when they try to expand? I mean, I'll go back to early on our conversation, not building the foundation correctly. Um, you know, again, like as an agency, you get to step in and see the strengths and weaknesses of so many different companies and understand quickly where they are. And, you know, oftentimes you'll step into a 
digitally native brand that's really strong at data and really strong um, digitally, but has never set up a store properly and doesn't really, you know, and in their case, they don't know how to build up store operational infrastructure or, uh, you know, a great brand um, like Nike that, you know, was just maybe the, the greatest brand in the world, you know, greatest brand ever who was like, how, how are we going to build retail? We're so good at brand right now. How can we make sure that we express the full sort of throttle excitement of what Nike being a Nike athlete is in a physical space. So mm -hmm. making sure that you, and they have obviously have been able to do it with flying colors, but I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I think that, that like, like really understanding um, that each one of those different ecosystems are slightly different and they require a new perspective on architecture and how you build them ground up and extend from your business enterprise, I think is super important. So I would say that, and then, you know, also keeping it simple at the same time and making sure mm -hmm. that you're delivering the same messaging and the same brand and the same experience across every different touch point. And that is what we did for Nike is the direct to consumer brand strategy across their global organization. Um, really understanding how they can um, speak speak the same language and you know yeah. and, and talk to their customer at every different touch point because people are going to learn about a brand in one place, a product mm -hmm. in another, and you know transact in yet another. So it has to be that mm -hmm. kind of experience throughout. I I wonder with the progression of digital, I, I wonder if brands feel the pressure. I know consumers feel the pressure I, and I'm sure brands do feel the pressure to be the first, the fastest, because digital moves at such a pace that we're all seemingly trying to keep up. So how do you mentor a brand if they build the foundation, but they're just trying to keep up? Do you keep chasing or do you pick your spot? You know, they're, how how does a brand decide that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a good question. And I guess it's very sort of timely. Um, you know, I've engaged a lot of a lot of times now with those longer strategies. Mm -hmm. With like, mm -hmm. he, here's you know, here's coming on board, understanding what the strengths, the weaknesses, what the stakeholders are responsible for, what the measures of success are, and then you know, how can we create uh, a roadmap for, mm -hmm. you know, listen, you need to have short-term wins and long-term success. So how can we do that all at the same time? So I find myself doing, you know, doing quite a lot of that these days where I come in and, and help them uh, put together, you know, that strategy, that plan, and then bring in great teams to, you know, to hit all of those goals and those roadmaps. So I enjoy stuff like that because you get to know the organization really well and um, the people and, and make yeah. stuff happen. As someone who's owned an agency for more than, you know, 10 plus years, mm -hmm. what do you feel like are some mistakes that you guys have made? I mean, listen, a lot, you know, it's like, I don't know how vulnerable you want me to get as sort of a business owner, but the idea of hiring people and not firing them fast enough um, comes to mind. The sort of, you know, classic agency conundrum of not contracting, expanding and contracting according to how much work you have and really, you know, wanting to build a company and not, um, and you know, sometimes just having too many people on staff for how much work is in house at one time and really struggling with cash flow problems, I think is one of the things that, you know, sort of per pervades um, throughout and, you know, an agency and it kind of degrades the fabric of the business. Like you'll have, you know, 50 people on staff and enough business for 15 people. And that's fine because, you know, that, but you have to right size your business to make sure that you're, you know, so I think that like 
operational issues like that. I think early on in my career, um, you know, I might certainly micromanaged um, mm. too many, you know, too many parts of the business um, yeah. is certainly something that also comes to mind. And then, you know, um, also early on in my year, just a, a lack of, you know, a lack of focus. Like we, we mm-hmm. built and launched some products to varying success. And I think that like, you really just have to be very careful with things like that. Um, you know, the greatest thing about an agency is you work on lots of different projects and lots of interesting things. Um, but it can really start to, you know, your focus can be in many different places at once and you have to, you know, you really have to just make sure you're aware of that and not, um, and be just an agency person. Um, and yeah. it's something that I've recently really kind of re-fallen in love with. Um, I had gone to work for a product company um, for a while and they had sort of lured me in there and, you know, they, and I really enjoyed it for a little while to work in-house. I've worked also in-house for a, a, a cosmetics brand as well. Um, I like the stability of it, but also, you know, they had trouble with funding and trouble with all, you know, the usual suspects over the last year and a half. And, um, you know, I realized that what I really, you know, liked was running an agency. And I've recently, it's sort of rekindled my love for just solving great, you know, solving problems for brands and creating great experiences for customers. But, you know, that not embracing your, your strong points and trying to do too much is something that, you know, I feel that I made a lot of mistakes in trying to just be like a pleaser and do too many things, you know, all at one time. And as you kind of get older and a little bit more mature, you really realize you just can't do it. So, yeah. Well, thank you for your honesty. I also personally appreciate the fact that you bring the analytical and the creative sides together because that's the world that I live in every day. And, um, I, I really think that that's very important. I wish we had, um, you know, more people that, that understood both are equally important and together they're a superpower. (laughs) Tell us, you know, a book or a podcast that you've listened to that you feel is just a wealth of knowledge. Um, I most recently read the battle of ink and ice by um, my friend Daryl Hartman, who is, um, you know, like I love, I love nonfiction around explorers and adventures of the last, you know, of ages past and the Battle of Ink and Ice is about uh, uh, polar explorers and all of this, like, you know, sort of the, um, the birth of news, newspapers and yeah, and sensational reports about, you know, experts exploration discovery and how it related back to um yeah how you know media and communication sort of grew um to 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 support these uh great explorers that were the sort of heroes of their country back in the you know 16 17 1800s 1900s and i mean these were great innovators that were innovating in adventures and innovating in how they traveled to the North pole. And, you know, so that I loved that book. It was a great one. And there's a a podcast. um, I think it's the age of explorers or something, but I love, I love stuff like that and really kind of reading and hearing about how innovators um, of times past really kind of persevered. Once again, I'm hearing the combination of the marketer, the creative and the teacher all coming together. And it seems like you're finding the, the, the content that really mixes those two. Um, Cause you're talking about explorers, but you're taking away, you know, business learnings about innovating. So that's, that's really good um, insight into how your mind works. So I like it. Yes. If there's one person right now, currently, that you feel is doing life right or winning at life, who is that? I mean, my hero is is certainly Yvonne Chouinard, the inventor of Patagonia. I mean, the guy who started the brand, who started, I mean, you're in Long Beach, California, so yeah. I mean, this is a guy who 
you know, is it excelled at adventure, at sports, at like he has put up, he's put up climbs and ice climbs at the top end of the range, sort of athletically and, you know, in risk. And he's also built just an outstanding brand and um, business that is, you know, um, part of the fabric of our culture and is con contributory towards, you know, uh, the environment. I mean, who else could have, I don't, nobody comes close as far as yeah. I'm yeah, I, I do agree with you. Very inspiring and has stayed true to the original vision and mission of that company. Never wavered and never, ever ha has sacrificed culture yeah. for, for yeah, you know, what, what that company stands for. So that's a great answer. I, I love it. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us today. I have side notes about, you know, digital different digital questions that kept coming to mind that i could ask all day so you know i'll ping you on the side but thank you so nice. much for joining us today and i think the takeaway from today if there's one thing to concentrate on is strong foundations make sure that you have strong foundations for everything that you do business and personal so thank you guys for joining us today on ASD Market Week's podcast, Talk a Little Shop. And until next time, keep that foundation strong. Be sure to subscribe to ASD Market Week's Let's Talk a Little Shop, a podcast that can be found on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, or Spotify. See you there.